good day. I am Professor Shijoy Ghosh of IIT Kharagpur and I teach in the Computer Science and Engineering Department. I will be taking this course on computer networks. So, we will be having about 40 lectures uh, in this series. So, today we will start with an introductory lecture which is about the emergence of computer networks, it is a brief history and a little bit about the um, protocols and reference models which is a, an abstract view of computer networks. Okay, the textbooks for the um, course will be uh, these three computer networking a top down approach featuring internet that is one by Kuros, data and computer communication by William Stallings and uh, computer networks by A. S. Tannenbaum. Okay. So, uh, some of the material that we will be covering here uh, verbally as well as in the slides uh, will be from these books. Okay. Now, the first uh, question is what is a computer network? So, a computer network is a number of computers also known as nodes connected by some communication lines. So, we have these computers which are connected by some communication lines. So, two computers connected to the network can communicate with each other through other nodes if they are not directly connected, which means that a computer does not have to be uh, connected to all the other computers in the network in order to uh, communicate with uh, any of them. Okay. It may be an indirect communication via some other computer. Okay. And the uh, other point is that these nodes, they are computers, but some of them are not computers. Some of them are uh, sort of network devices. Now, there are various kinds of network devices like switches, routers, etcetera. So, they could also uh, so, they facilitate the communication and running of this entire network. So, they are also taken as nodes in the network. So, finally, we have uh, some of the nodes, uh, um, some nodes which may be either computers or uh, there may be network devices like switches and routers and there is a communication between them. This communication of course, uh, can be uh, of various types, we will come to that uh, presently. Uh, so, uh, the computers can communicate with each other. Now, what do they communicate? They exchange information between different computers. Now, this information could be of any kind of information. They could be data used by uh, a program or uh, they could be um, uh, some program itself or it could be any kind of information really. Okay. So, that is one of the basic and major use of computer network. Of course, there are other specialized uses of computer networks. For example, interconnected small computers can replace a large computer. For example, you have a very large computation to uh, perform and so for that either you need a very powerful and very large computer which may be costly. The other option could be that you break up this work into very small pieces and assign them to the small computers. So, the small computers sort of uh, do the computation on that small uh, chunk of the problem and then they communicate with each other to form the final uh, solution. Then the other use of computer networks which is coming into uh, vogue uh, very much these days is that the it can you can use this network as a communication tool. Okay. We know okay, the very basic say for example, uh, you send emails to um, I mean you can send emails to almost anybody these days and that is really a very cheap and very fast uh, mode of communication. Secondly, the computer network could also be used for direct communication like uh, say you could have <coughs> Uh, co communicate uh, through voice over a co computer network, you can communicate through video over a computer network. So, uh, all these different co uh, communication is converging into this computer network and as a matter of fact, nowadays when we talk about the network, we do not 
look upon it just as a, a computer network as a matter of fact it is the um, bedrock on which say all this uh, computing communication all these are converging and then of course you have uh, some applications which are necessarily of uh, distributed nature all right for example let us say uh, railway reservation system now obviously you even if you had a large computer to um, handle all the railway reservations in the world in one place but you would not want uh, all the people to go to one place and uh, sort of form a huge queue so you want to distribute uh, this functionality that means for that of booking tickets um, all over the country and that's uh, uh, what we do so these are sort of examples of distributed systems so this is a distributed reservation system similarly there could be other kinds of distributed systems there could be distributed databases and all kinds of applications so <coughs> that is the other application of uh, networks now a quick look at the uh, history of um, this um, computers first and then we will sort of focus on uh, uh, computer networks well in 1948 we have the first commercial computer installed it was an univac uh, that was a big uh, company once upon a time and then in 1958 uh, the first us communication satellite uh, 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 became operational uh, so uh, you see the network always has these two components one is that you have to have to have these computers and then you have to have these communication channels and uh, uh, sat, uh, satellite uh, communication is of course one of an important uh, medium of communication then in 1964 we have an airline reservation system which uses some kind of uh, packet uh, switching network it was proposed by the rand corporation and in 1969 ARPANET the first packet switching network began its operation this was actually um, a watershed event as we will see this had very far reaching impact on the way computer networks developed then in 1971 we have the first uh, computer chip previous computers were made uh, through very uh, low level uh, gates and all but the first uh, four bit small computer chip with 2300 transistors and uh, they became uh, available in 1971 in 1972 ethernet specifications was formulated now this ethernet is one uh, um, protocol so to say uh, so we will talk about uh, protocols and different kinds of protocols and ethernet remains uh, one of the most important uh, network protocols that we use so that was first formulated in 1972 uh, in 1974 IBM introduced its own version of network uh, in, in SNA then in 1975 Altair 8800 first commercial microcomputer that was sold as a kit so we are actually looking at the a very brief history of computers in general so in 1975 we had the Paul Allen and uh, Bill Gates getting together which eventually formed uh, they formed Microsoft we all know about Microsoft 1976 was Nike and Jobs built Apple one so Apple also had a lot of contribution to make in uh, to computers uh, in various uh, aspects and the uh, Windows system that we see today uh, almost everywhere it was basically it started from uh, Apple computers in 1979 we had the VCCalc as the first commercial spreadsheet so that is a very popular uh, application of computers these days in 1981 IBM introduced IBM PC on with one floppy drive okay later on they changed it with a drive and a hard drive also and in 1983 TCP IP so this TCP IP is another network uh, mm, protocol that we are using actually we use both Ethernet and uh, TCP IP so we actually we have different protocols which are running on the network we require and how these different protocols are arranged and how they are used that uh, 
I will cover today in the second part of the lecture. So, this TCP IP is another important protocol that is still very much prevalent today that uh, became the official protocol of ARPANET. Remember the ARPANET we talked about that is a network which was set up in USA under uh, DRDO uh, and which had a very far reaching impact on the way networks developed. In 1984, Apple introduced GUI uh, with Apple Macintosh and 1986, we see the first laptop PCs, 88, so IBM uh, gives a multitasking OS for the PCs, 1989, Microsoft releases Windows, so which is another multitasking system um, in the, that is the Microsoft version. 1989, NSF, that is the National Sounds foundation of USA, it replaces ARPANET as internet backbone and then WWW was invented by CERN physicist Tim Berners-Lee in 1991. So, this advent of WWW uh, that means the World Wide Web really made uh, the network very, very popular. So, there was this kind of uh, positive feedback going on, okay. as it became uh, more popular, more and more people jumped into it, as people, jump, uh, as people showed their interest. So, commercial companies also then uh, became interested, because there would be a market for uh, something in networks that they do. And when the commercial companies developed something, naturally it became more easier to use the network, they had more functionalities. So, more people became interested, okay. so that was the positive loop, which uh, uh, made uh, this, uh, I mean actually then the growth of network in the past decade, that means in the 90s let us say, has been absolutely phenomenal. Okay. And if the um, basic so called killer app, that is the killer application, the application which attracted so many people to networks was this WWW, which was invented in 1991. In 1992, Mosaic released first GUI web browser, so that was a web browser. Then Netscape became the popular web browser. Microsoft, of course, had its own version of uh, Microsoft uh, Explorer, uh, so that was another browser. And then it all built up into some kind of a frenzy. And in 2000, we had this dot com, so called dot com meltdown. That means, I mean people became absolutely frenzied about the growth of uh, computers and uh, of course, such a frenzy cannot go on forever, so it has to come to a halt, so it did in 2000, but the development of networks and its utility and importance remains. So, now let us go to a brief history more focused on the network itself, so, uh, so that part, so we were in general talking about the computing scene in general. So, in mid 1960s, USA Department of Def, uh, Defense wanted a command and control network that could survive a nuclear attack. Now, if something had to survive a nuclear attack, then you have to distribute it. Okay. So, that was uh, one uh, strong reason that uh, we want a distributed system and if you have a distributed uh, system, these systems must be able to communicate. So, that was the seed of this project. The subnet should consist of uh, some Honeywell 12 kW intermediate message processor. So, there are some kind of uh, early network devices you might say, uh, which are connected by 64 kbps lines. These uh, IMPs or intermediate message processors were connected to uh, the various computers and the IMPs themselves were connected by telephone lines from telephone company. Later, the IMP software was changed to terminal interface processor, uh, which allowed the connection of terminals. In 1970s, NSF set up a machine connected to the ARPANET to which other universities could dial up and connect. Now, this became very um, um, I mean important in the sense that many people were interested in this. So, NSF upgraded their system uh, in various ways and by mid 1980s, NSF built a new backbone to connect its supercomputing centers to some regional networks. So, this uh, backbone was upgraded to 440 kb, uh, 8 kbps and then to 1.5 mbps fiber backbone and once this fiber backbone was there, communication was really fast. So, it allowed network connection to hundreds of thousands of universities, research labs, libraries, museums, etcetera. So, as the growth continued, 
Now commercial houses began to take notice and to join the decentralized model uh, began to take hold. <coughs> and um, as I mean as I just uh, described earlier that as uh, the commercial uh, people uh, joined, so there was a lot of innovation by a lot of people. Uh, one of the major driving force uh, in the computing networks uh, in the past decades or even now maybe has been the uh, role of so called startup companies. By startup companies that means that some uh, young engineers maybe or some young people they had some very bright idea which they developed. Uh, to a certain extent and if when that was sort of uh, proven uh, then some big company would possibly buy up their company or give them money to get access to this kind of technology and a lot of people uh, and there were so many success stories uh, that a lot of people got interested in it and when a lot of people think about a problem naturally there is a lot of innovation. So that is how computer networks had an explosive growth in the whole of 90s and even in the in this century that is 21st century um, I mean the growth is going on. Although uh, the um, frenzy in the stock exchanges etc about these dot com companies that sort of crashed in uh, 2000, but the growth in the uh, field of networks and its use in various walks of life that is continuing. Okay, with this brief historical background, now let us come to uh, the networks and some kind of a <coughs> uh, structure or some kind of an abstract view of this computer network. All right, uh, we have I have already mentioned that computer networks would be a number of nodes, and nodes could be computers or nodes could be uh, um, network devices also which are connected by some communication lines. Okay. Now when I say that uh, of course uh, sometimes things are not so simple. Uh, sometimes you do have a line between two nodes let us say, so giving us the so called point to point communication that means one node A is communicating directly to one another node B where A and B are connected by a direct line let us say okay it could be a physically uh, some copper line or some fiber line etc so uh, but this point to point connection could be so in the simplest case they are actually dedicated uh, but in the dedicated case also we have some different uh, cases for example you could have simplex communication by simplex communication we mean that communication can go in only one direction in that line all right it could be half duplex by half duplex that means that uh, the communication could uh, go both ways either way either from A to B or from B to A, but only in one direction at a time. And full duplex of course that A and B can communicate with each other simultaneously that is parallelly uh, at the same time. Okay. So that means there is communication from A to B and from B to A at the same time. Okay. So, these are the different kinds of dedicated uh, lines. Then if the nodes are not say computer some uh, network devices uh, specifically if they are sort of multiplexer, then we could share a point to point medium. That means there is one line from A to B, but A is connected to a lot of other uh, nodes let us say A1, A2 to AN and B is connected again to a lot of other nodes say B1, B2 to Bn and they could all these Ais and Bis they could all communicate through this one single line which is between A and B. So uh, this um, we will see later how uh, such a thing can be done. So this business of sharing the, a link uh, over time or, or, or whatever even parallelly sometimes that is possible. Uh, so, sharing this link by multiple people that is called multiplexing. So, these are the different kinds of point to point links, but point to point links are not the only things we have. For example, we could have a broadcast uh, kind of link. For example, if you have a satellite um, communication, okay, a satellite uh, sort of throws its signal um, all over the country or maybe all over the region. 
Uh, so that is something which is being broadcast to everything. So you cannot really put it down as a point to point link between something. But of course, you could use that um, shared medium and a broadcast in some way to uh, make temporary point to point links or your application may be such that you want to broadcast something. Okay. For example, we broadcast TV signal. Similarly, there are things you might want to broadcast all over. So, uh, there could be, uh, so this broadcast medium again could be dedicated uh, to some user or it could be shared. That means, it is shared between multiple users. So, there the term that is used is multiple access, a, share, a medium to which different uh, users are connected at different points and it is a broadcast kind of medium. Uh, uh, so, in a distributed fashion, they have some protocol of uh, deciding how to share this because if it is in the same place. Uh, you can uh, uh, the business of sharing becomes somewhat easier, so you can multiplex it. But uh, if it is if the nodes themselves are distributed over this broadcast medium, physically distributed, that is, so you will have to have some kind of protocol. So that is called multiple access. So you can have a shared broadcast medium also. That is also quite common. And then finally, we have this. Um, um, uh, something which is in between broadcasting and point to point, which is called multicasting. This means that say we have a, have a group, I have say some friends and I want to send some things which not to one particular friend, but to my group of friends, but to no others. So, multicasting is basically uh, giving your, I mean communicating to a specified group. So, using such communication link, we have uh, uh, these computer networks and the networks themselves are, um, I mean quite often uh, popularly they are uh, sort of divided into local area network, metropolitan area network and wide area network. Uh, local area network is uh, just that, which means that it is local, that means it is sort of, uh, um, it is sort of limited to maybe one building or maybe to a small uh, group of uh, buildings. So, it is its size is small that is one thing. There are some other um, things about local area network which makes the issues of local area network somewhat different from a larger network. So, and that is that a local area network would usually be privately owned. Now, uh, how does ownership come into picture? Ownership comes into picture because if you have a same owner for the entire network, then you can have the same policy. All right. So, which is not the case if it is a very wide area network, we will come to that wide area network that is the other case, uh, where there may be I mean the different parts uh, of uh, I mean there are various nodes which are connected to this wide area network, uh, the, the nodes may belong to very different people and they may have very different ideas about what should be done and uh, about all their policies. Okay. So, that makes that uh, wide area networking uh, somewhat different from uh, local area networking. And in between, we have this metropolitan area network. Okay. Metropolitan area means say a network which is spread over a community or a maybe even a city. So, they are bigger sizes than local area networks. And there, uh, one of the issues which is very important is the access issues, which means that how do you connect? For example, you want to make an entire community networked. Uh, so, uh, how do you connect each one of them because they are geographically more distributed than a local area network. Local area network maybe you would like to, uh, sometimes we would use um, wireless, sometimes we would just simply draw wire and the cost will not be very prohibitive, but uh, in local area how we connect the people that becomes an issue. So, that is the access issue. And we have talked about the wide area network, wide area networks are costly, uh, they are um, uh, that means naturally when you are talking about communicating over um, maybe hundreds or thousands of uh, kilometers, okay, uh, the communication is costly, the cost has come down okay. uh, and that is another thing which has historically happened. As uh, more and more people got interested in the network. Uh, technology developed that is one side of the issue. The other side of the issue is that the volumes went up, which means that the number of people who used uh, networks. So, the as the volumes went up, the cost went down. 
So, the technology improved on in one direction. So, that was uh, one input into bringing down the cost and the other uh, uh, issue was that more and more people uh, started using it. So, the volume to a particular uh, company let us say developing something in the network area. Uh, so, that went up. So, they could make it uh, make things cheaper and as the whole thing becomes cheaper and cheaper more and more people wanted to get to uh, join the network all right. But wide area network cost is still an issue and of course, wide area network as I said that it is uh, uh, it may connect various local area networks. So, it is a network of networks or inter network in or I mean as we uh, know it very popularly these days that is the internet. Uh, internet. Okay. Now, let us look at um, abstract um, idea. Um, about the um, abstract uh, idea about the network in general. So, in the formal framework, we have what are known as protocols. Okay. Now, uh, why do we need protocols in networks? We need protocols in networks because network by its very nature, they may connect uh, various different people and as I said, various different people may have very different ideas about how things are to be done. Now, if people have very different ideas about how uh, things are to be done, then um, but they have to agree on some uh, common basis, otherwise they cannot communicate. And this common basis is the protocol. Okay. Uh, so, there are actually uh, there are a number of protocols which are used in any uh, network and we will uh, be getting into that. Uh, but uh, so, you and I may have very different ideas about how some particular thing may be done. So, I may be doing this in a certain way, you may be doing the same thing maybe in a completely different way, but if we want to communicate, we have to agree uh, on some minimum uh, protocol. So, that is the protocol. So, these protocols are the building blocks of this network okay, architecture. So, each protocol object has two different interfaces. One is the service interface that defines operations on this protocol and peer to peer interface which defines messages exchange with peer. Which means that for example, any protocol, uh, so a protocol is let us say between peers all right. So, if in this um, diagram, so these LIs, so there is so uh, these two boxes LIs, two LIs, they are the uh, these two LIs, they are the um, different uh, I mean peers and they communicate with each other through this peer interface that is the protocol. Now, this protocol is supposed to achieve something, it is supposed to do something. For this, it requires something may be from uh, some other uh, so called layer. So, actually we have a layered architecture and I am coming to that in the next slide. So, how this protocol is to be invoked etcetera, for this we have a service interface and between the peers we have a peer interface. So, this is a, uh, so we have uh, uh, all these different layers. So, we have this n plus 1 th layer and n th layer and n minus 1 th layer in general. Okay. So, actually uh, these how they are to be layered about that also there are some standards and we will just uh, look at two of them at least. So, well, let us say for example, this networking business is uh, broken up into uh, I mean whatever the jobs you have to do for achieving uh, uh, for smooth functioning of computer network, we uh, break them up into different functionalities and these functionalities are in different layers. Now, this is all in one place that means, in one node. Similarly, another node which is connected to the network will have its own um, layers and this at the same level let us say n and n here they are peers. Okay. So, there will be a protocol between this n and n, whereas there will be a service interface between the n plus 1th layer and nth layer. Similarly, there may be a service interface between the nth layer and n minus 1th layer and so on. So, let us see what they are like. So, as I said most networks are organized as a series of layers. The task of each layer is to give some service to the upper layer. So, that is the task of each layer and any layer maintains a virtual connection with the corresponding layer in a peer. So, this virtual connection any layer which maintains a virtual connection this virtual connection 
is used for running the peer to peer protocol. Whereas, that uh, this is the service interface, the task of each layer. So, each layer performs certain tasks, certain sub tasks of this whole networking business, all right. So, each layer performs some task. So, this task is a service to the upper layer. Similarly, for performing this task, it may break it up into some sub task and some sub task may be delegated to a lower layer. So, this layer would have its own service interface to the lower layer. Whereas, the its own task which are whatever I mean assuming that the sub task is done by the lower layer, its own task is performed at the peer to peer level using the corresponding protocol. <coughs> so, there is peer to peer protocol running between any two corresponding and communicating layers. The interface between the layers in the same node is well defined. Well, uh, another point is that this for this peer to peer protocol mostly uh, they go through what is what I have just now called a virtual connection. That means, uh, so what is a virtual connection? Virtual connection <coughs> means that uh, well physically physical connection we understand let us say two co computers are connected by a wire. Okay. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier two computers may not uh, I mean it is not necessary that the two computers need to be directly connected in order to communicate. It may be an indirect connection also that means, it is going through from uh, one computer to another to another then it is hopping from node to node and then it reaches finally, its destination. <coughs> so, there is no direct physical communication although let us say when you are surfing the internet let us say which is a very common experience these days. So, you have connected to some computer which may be um, in the opposite part of the globe. So, to you it appears that you are sort of directly connected to that computer. Okay. So, whenever you are clicking something over here something happens which something happens means of course, something happens. So, that your clicking of the mouse uh, uh, somehow that gets communicated to that uh, remote server uh, remote web server and it uh, may be the page changes or something. All right. So, there is there seem to be a direct communication, but this communication is only virtual. The physical communication is only at the lowest layer, where physically something may be communicated by a connected by uh, a piece of wire or it may be connected by fiber optic links or it may be connected by may be satellite links whatever it is. So, that is a that is the physical connection. So, that is why this uh, um, for running all these protocols these uh, peers need to communicate and this communicate is through a virtual um, connection. Okay, the, now, the implementation of each layer in each node is transparent to other nodes. Okay. Mm. Now, actually this is the main point of having this layered architecture that the implementation of each layer in each node is transparent to the uh, uh, to the um, uh, other to other nodes. As I said that uh, I may want to do this one particular sub task in some uh, uh, some particular way I means let us say some company X and then some company Y wants to uh, do the same thing maybe in a different way. Now, you need not stop any of them okay. so long as they agree on the protocol, so long as they agree on the <coughs> service uh, service layers that what is the service interface between the different layers because uh, upper layer service may be given by uh, some product of some company, whereas the lower uh, layer of the um, um, lower layer is may be developed by some other company. Now, once again, if they can uh, decide on the interface between these two layers, it is all right. Now, then they are very free to do it in their own way. The same thing ap um, applies to the peers. For example, say two nodes uh, or say two particular layers in two particular nodes may be peers and let us say they, these nodes are computers themselves. All right. Now, one may be a may be an IBM machine another may be a sun machine or something all right and uh, they may have they will have different uh, uh, um, operating system they will have different processors etcetera, but so far as the peer to peer protocol is concerned they agree. Okay. So, these are the messages I will send and then the, if I am expecting this kind of answer and he said okay, these are the kinds of messages that I will accept and this kind of answer will be given etcetera etcetera. So, that is how a protocol goes. So, so long as they agree on this protocol 
these two companies are free to develop their product in their own way and when you allow that naturally uh, people can innovate people can put in different things so long as you are uh, conforming to the standards uh, of the protocol and the interfaces etc you can develop your own thing in a uh, in your own way and that is very good for the development of the program uh, of the of this entire network and the other point is that this is uh, uh, one way of abstracting out all these uh, uh, unnecessary details from the for example any of these uh, networking oper i mean say networked operating system in a computer or a networking device okay they may be very very complex indeed okay uh, and some of the complexity is special to the implementer okay uh, one implementer has decided to implement something in a some particular way and that will have a whole lot of details now we are not really interested in that one we want to abstract out of that so we concentrate on these protocols and the interfaces and the functionalities so that gives us a fairly general picture about the entire uh, networking <coughs> i mean how networking is done and then if you are uh, really if you go into a business of developing some of these modules yourself then you have to go into uh, some more nuts and bolts about how this uh, service can be given. <coughs> now, the protocols between peer layers can be changed if the peers all agree naturally if you are changing the protocol all the peers have to agree otherwise the communication will break down. However, it need not be referred to other layers. So, that is another good thing about layering that means when I am changing something in this layer I may so far so, so long as I am not changing anything in the interface between the upper layer and this my layer or between myself and the lower layer so long as I am not changing anything in the interface internally whatever change I make will not matter. So, that is the good point of this layering and the service definitions tells what the layer does and nothing else ok. So, that means nothing else means nothing about the specifics of implementation which may vary from uh, one uh, vendor to another vendor. The interface tells the process above it how to access it it specifies what the parameters are and what results can be expected. So, we have uh, two uh, uh, ok I have mentioned here three uh, uh, models. So, so, three layered models the most famous is the OSI reference model which we will look into some of the details and then TCP IP reference model which is most widely used actually alright. So, OSI reference model uh, I mean some part of it is somewhat uh, theoretical because many people do not really um, do that and it uh, they do not consider that part to be very important, uh, but TCP IP reference model is something which is almost ubiquitous and for ATM. Uh, so, the ATM is one uh, networking technology which is rather complete technology I mentioned here uh, this here just as an example. So, that is another kind of reference model. So, there are all kinds of different uh, reference models. Um, sometimes these models. So, these models are basically a description of the different layers that are there and then uh, naturally if you uh, talk about the layers so what that layer is supposed to do uh, uh, that is what you say and, and then how it is to be interfaced with the layer above and the uh, layer below. Uh, so, since this is just a number of layers one on top of the other they are also referred to as stacks sometimes. So, we call about the TCP IP stack and the OSI stack and so on ATM stack. So, other protocol stacks exist and new ones are possible. However, to the extent to which a particular model is universally accepted is the key to its success. As I said that a lot of thought went into OSI reference model, but in practice TCP IP became much more uh, prevalent ok. So, um, let us see the OSI reference model. This has seven layers ok and these layers are application layer the presentation layer, the session layer, the network layer, the data link layer and the physical layer which means that in order that uh, um, uh, people can communicate over this uh, network in a very seamless manner the all the jobs that are um, involved that have been broken down into seven parts and they are the different uh, seven layers. So, application layer is something and then presentation session network data link and physical layer. So, each layer has some kind of functionality and all these functionalities together gives you the uh, network overall functionality in the network. 
So, just a little bit more about uh, peer level communication. Uh, messages sent from one application to another application on different hosts. So, it travels down the layers on the sending machine and each layer adds a header to be used by its corresponding peer level and the bottom layer which is the physical layer sends the message to the receiving machine. So, this is the uh, general scheme. Uh, the point is that suppose uh, we start something at the very top, let us say in the case of OSI uh, we call it the application layer. Okay. So, something has something, some communication has been initiated at the uh, application layer. All right. Now, this application layer mind you is really it has its peer let us say in the destination uh, machine. Uh, so, in the destination machine also some application layer program is running. For example, let us say you are uh, doing a telnet kind of uh, thing that means, you are sort of logging on to another machine. So, you are doing a telnet to another machine. So, you will start your telnet program which will be a telnet client program and the destination machine will have uh, will now the who will um, sort of respond to a telnet client only a telnet server we can respond to a telnet client. So, this telnet server is on the remote machine. So, these are the two modules both of which are in the application layer. Now, how telnet is an example of a protocol, this is an application layer protocol and what this protocol does, how the telnet uh, client will uh, request, how the telnet server will respond etcetera, these are the uh, internals of this particular protocol namely the telnet protocol. Now, so far as the telnet client or any of these application program is concerned when it uh, tries to communicate to another application program in another machine. Uh, it just knows about this protocol and how things are to be done at that layer. But how is it, how is this communication to go from this machine to another machine? For this, if you put the whole thing in the same program, then that becomes very complicated. That was the idea of layering. That means, so give him a sort of virtual connection. So, he will sort of uh, for communicating to the um, uh, target machine he will have some data to sort of send. So, that we will add up to uh, maybe other kinds of data and then hand it over to the lower layer in the same node. Okay. Now, the lower layer similarly may be running a protocol with the corresponding layer in the um, remote machine. So, for that protocol it needs to do some communication. So, for that communication whatever uh, message is to be sent here that get added to the original data which was uh, sent by the application layer. So, this way as the um, um, message to be sent moves down the stack from the originating machine at each layer, each layer is running its own protocol with its pair. So, it has some message to uh, sort of add or uh, give to his pair. So, they will keep on adding it to this. So, this becomes fatter and fatter as it goes down. Now, as it goes down to the uh, physical layer there it can now communicate to the remote machine. And in the remote machine, this will now again move up the stack and at each layer that particular um, uh, the program or whatever that module in that layer, he will take out the message which has been sent by its peer in the um, um, source. So, that is how communication will go on for all these protocols. So, um, sending uh, um, um, a message, so received on the receiving side and it is passed up through each layer and each layer reads the corresponding um, header. That means, the corresponding header which has been sent by uh, the by its own peer on the uh, from the source machine. All right. So, this is an example. Let us say we have two machines uh, and one machine is a DOS machine that means, uh, it is uh, some um, DOS is of course, an old operating system which used to run on PCs and uh, uh, which was there from the Microsoft DOS and the PC DOS etcetera, IBM DOS was there and Macintosh was a different company as I mentioned. So, it is a, so these two can still communicate that means, they are two very different machines, but this original uh, data which was there which was uh, which sort of originated from the application layer. Now, there is a presentation layer. Now, this presentation layer will add its own presentation proto header to this original data. Now, this whole thing becomes sort of data for the next layer namely the session layer. So, session layer will add its own header. So, as I said that the original data becomes 
fatter and fatter and fatter till it comes to the physical layer. Now, at the physical layer, data is actually sent, let us say in one hop to the uh, destination machine. Now, here as this whole fat packet travels up, each layer will strip off its corresponding header which is coming from its peer in the source. So, that is how the uh, each of the peers can communicate and each of them has a virtual connection with the uh, destination machine, although the actual connection is the physical connection. Okay. So, uh, these are the um, uh, seven protocol layers, now we are going bottom up and I will just tell you in brief, later on I will just go uh, down to how they are uh, sort of some more details about each of these uh, layers. So, first is the physical link which is how to uh, uh, transmit the bits um, and then uh, we have the uh, data link layer that means how to transmit frames. Now, what is the difference between transmitting bits and transmitting frames? We will see, uh, see to that, but uh, a data link basically is a direct connection that means how two computers which are directly or two nodes which are directly connected to each other, how they will communicate that is a matter of data link layer. Now, uh, as mentioned earlier computers need not be directly connected to each other in order to communicate, they have to be connected to the network somehow or other. So, if there is there are say two machines A and B or two nodes A and B which want to communicate and there is no direct link between A and B, so it may go via C, D, E and then B. All right. Now, how do you know that you have to go through C, D, E and then you will actually reach B? So, somebody has to keep track of the route, how to route the packets over the entire network. So, that is the job of the network layer. Then there is a transport layer that means how to send packets to the application. Now, we have been talking about packets, a packet is a uh, sort of some data which is sort of has been segregated and put into a sort of packaged. Uh, together, so that is a packet, um, but the original application layer need not have any concept of any packet. So, somebody has to packetize all this data and there are maybe other functions in the transport layer. So, that is uh, the, they make packets out of the data given by the upper layer, uh, so that is a transport layer. Then is session layer which manages the virtual connection between in the of the application layer, which manages the virtual connection. Uh, and some properties of this connection, we will talk about it. The presentation layer that means, how do you encode and decode messages? That means, two uh, different machines may have uh, two different ways of encoding things. Okay. Uh, so, there is a, that is the job of the presentation layer as well as the security comes here and application. So, whatever the actual job the user is interested in, the human user that is, uh, so that comes in the application layer. Okay. So, the application layer contains a variety of protocols, so it depends on what you are trying to do. Uh, so, the various users may want to do various things, the examples are FTP, Telnet, SMTP, HTTP etcetera. So, these are the names of some protocols. Okay. By the FTP protocol what you can do is that you can download uh, files from another machine, by HTTP you can uh, look at web pages, uh, surf etcetera, there is a um, protocol called SMTP which you use for sending mails. Okay. Now, you may not be, uh, you may not have come across these protocols directly, but the point is that whenever let us say you are sending a mail <coughs> from let us say an Unix machine or something, you are using the uh, SMTP protocol whether or not you know, know it. So, SMTP protocol has been built uh, into that. Similarly, uh, when you are telnetting that means, the telnet uh, server and the telnet client etcetera, they will be there in your machine as a part of the OS may be. So, the application layer usually requires reliable and cheap connection to its peer, that is what the application layer or what it is concerned about, that it must be connected reliably and cheaply to its peer. So, examples of peers we have uh, uh, so, so given some nodes giving service etcetera. Now, application layer hands this um, uh, whatever it has to send to the presentation layer which handles as I say the format of the data, protocol conversion, data translation whether it is ASCII or maybe some other EBIC DIC or something. So, data compression, data encryption these are handled in the presentation layer. 
in the session layer it allows applications on different computers to share a connection now what do i mean by connection the point is that later on just in the, as i go to the next layer you will see that i will packetize uh, the this uh, data uh, but then uh, so far as the user is concerned he wants a continuous connection so this connection is handled in the session layer so it can provide checkpoints that means if there is some disruption you may come back to it and uh, sort of um, get the original uh, some original state back and then you can retransmit if there is some this thing dialog control of who can transmit etc the transport layer the basic function of the transport layer is to accept data from the layer above split it into smaller units if necessary now why we need to split that we will come to that later on pass these so these are the packets so to say pass these to the network layer and ensure that the pri uh, pieces all arrive correctly and in the right order at the other end for example you have chopped them into pieces now they may uh, be become out of order so that's the business of the transport layer this should also be done in a cheap and efficient manner etc the same thing applies so the type of there may be different types of transport services so there may be multiple protocols here one could be error free point to point channels or it could be a very cheap uh, kind of channel or it uh, if it may broadcasting of messages to multiple destinations so these are the different types of transport services which are possible the network layer as i said it decides on what route to take locally so that the intended message ultimately reaches the destination it controls broadcasting by essentially segregating the different networks etc it handles technological mismatches so we will get into the details of this later on it does congestion control it had uh, handles billing information etc and the data link layer make the physical layer appear like a channel that is free of transmission errors actually in the physical layer there may be errors but the data link layer handles this error correction etc at the very lowest level and finally at the lowest level we have the physical layer where data is actually transmitted as raw bits etc the other layer is tcp ip reference model where the session and the presentation layer are not uh, there so we have the application layer transport layer network layer and maybe something like the data link or the physical layer so the rough correspondence is something like this we have the tcp ip model where you have just this few and you have the osi reference model with so many so more or less they match the essential functions match and there are other kinds of uh, protocols uh, which are also used but the tcp ip and the osi these are the most common in the next class we will be <laughs> discussing the different structures of networks so today we just had an abstract view of networks in the next class we will handle the different uh, structures good day <coughs> so uh, in this lecture we will discuss the network topology okay now what do we mean by a uh, network topology mm. okay mm. so just uh, let's just have a quick recap of uh, what uh, we had learned last time basically a computer network would be a number of nodes which are connected by some communication links all right so uh, so there is some kind of a, what uh, we usually call a graph okay so this graph has certain structure so we talk about the structure now this structure has an implication about how we will go about communicating uh, as i said that it is in general not feasible to have one to one communication between each pair of nodes okay that is not possible at all so what kind of structure that means what there is nodes connected in which manner that is the uh, subject matter of discussion today okay <clears throat> so uh, a network may be represented as a graph as i said nodes representing computers or network devices like switches routers etc and the links represent communication links modes of communication may be broadcast or point to point we have uh, discussed this okay 
<coughs> now, um, now there are various. Uh, first, let us talk about the so-called land topologies. Uh, by land, you remember is uh, the local area network, and the local area network topologies are um, well. Three are very common: star, ring, and a bus. Okay, uh, so we will just uh, look at all of them. Um, so, first of all, we first take up this uh, bus topology. And why do we take up a bus topology? So, this is a very simple kind of network. Okay. So, this is based on a shared broadcast link. So, this. Um, so, we want to still want to do point to point communication. That means there may be so many nodes A, B, C, D, etc., which are. Um, Mm, which are connected to the network and A wants to communicate to B. Okay. So, C, D, E are, um, are connected that is all right, but A specifically wants to com communicate to B. So, each pair of communicating nodes use the link for a short time. So, A uses the link for a short time to send its message to B. Then after it, that is over, then uh, maybe C might uh, send something to D or something like that. So, other nodes ignore uh, the communication. So, since this is a shared broadcast link, all the links, uh, I mean, share all the nodes uh, get uh, the communication. So, that is not private in that sense. So, all the nodes uh, get to uh, get that communication, but they usually will ignore this communication. Whereas, um, a B will sort of uh, copy this for its uh, own purpose. Now, there has to be a distributed protocol to decide who gets to use the link. Okay. There has to be some protocol otherwise if A, a wants to communicate uh, with B and B wants to communicate uh, say C wants to communicate with D, uh, their communications will go and collide in the uh, shared uh, broadcast medium. So, the communication of uh, both the parties of uh, that means both the pairs of nodes uh, they will get garbled. So, that uh, the I mean and sometimes actually that uh, will happen that the things will get garbled but that is not what we uh, want to see.